Good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. And welcome to this webinar, Baltimore and Rotterdam Designing Cities. I'm Christina Murphy, and I am an assistant professor at the School of Architecture and Planning at Morgan State University and an adjunct professor at WAC, Virginia Tech. Today, Roberto Rocco will moderate this talk um, between uh, Jerome Gray and Zico Lopez presentation, um, respectively from Baltimore and from Rotterdam. This webinar asks the following question. Does the city influence the way we build our architecture? And how does the built environment shape our lives? And reflecting on the experience of the built environment around us, how do we experience the city? We shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. This is an observation by Winston Churchill made in 1943. From February to April, 2022, we will present nine lecture, feature, lectures feature, featuring dynamic discussions among, among the city of Rotterdam and Baltimore. Specifically, we will hear how design and policy can improve the built environment and provide access to all. Each week, two designers will discuss design topics from a social, spatial, and architectural point of view specific to Rotterdam and Baltimore. Through conversations, we will explore if and how the environment is determinant to the failure or the success of a project and what that means for the city, the citizens, and their well-being. All, you are, all, you, all of you are welcome to um, to ask questions, please use the question and answer button at the bottom of the screen. Be aware, however, that the panelists might not be seeing your questions. This afternoon, the moderator will be Roberto Rocco. He specialized in governance and policies for urban sustainability. Roberto deals with planning via political, political economy and philosophy and work as a consultant for the Union for the Mediterranean and European Commissions. Roberto, welcome. Thanks, Christina. Can you hear me well? Yes, um, loud and well. Very good. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Roberto. As Christina has just introduced, I'm an associate professor of spatial planning and strategy at the Delft University of Technology. And I'm here to introduce our two speakers of the night, of the day, depending where you are, uh, Jerome Gray and Zico Lopez. And I'm going to introduce them um, uh, at once, and then we will hear from Jerome. But uh, Jerome Gray uh, founded Jerome C. Gray Architects in 2013. Jerome is a licensed architect in Maryland, Michigan, and Washington, D.C., with over 30 years of experience in design and planning. Uh, Jerome is an artist and historian who has documented the history of architects, buildings, and sites through exhibitions, publications, seminars, and lectures. He has served as a juror and advisor for Morgan State uh, Center for the Built Environment and in Infrastructure Studies over the last decade. He was born raised and educated in Detroit, Michigan. Zico Lopez uh, from here, the Netherlands, is an architect and spatial researcher born on uh, the Cape Verde Islands and raised here in Rotterdam West. After high school, he studied architecture at TU Delft. Before graduating from the university in 2009, he did a semester at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and attempted the studio, attended the studio revitalizing Brightmoor, Detroit, under the super, supervision of Professor Craig Wilkins. After his graduation, he started working as a freelance architect. He has been involved in several projects in the Netherlands and abroad, including National Art Museum in Mindelo, Cabo Verde, in collaboration with Ramos Castello Architects in 2000. 18, he founded Spatial Codes, Studio for Architecture and Inclusion, an architecture student that deals with the relationship between humans and their immediate living environment, with the aim of creating spatial interventions that add values and at the same time 
amplify the sense of space, place and time for both the environment and as well as users. Uh, without further ado, uh, we will hear from Jerome first, uh, then we will immediately hear from Zico, and then we will have a debate. And hopefully uh, the audience can also ask questions. Uh, Jerome, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Roberto. Um, I should warn everybody ahead of time that uh, I just found out through Roberto's introduction that Zico has spent time in Detroit, Michigan. I am all about Detroit, Michigan. So we're probably gonna take up the entirety of the time of questions and answers just talking about that place. So, uh, so be, be forewarned, that's a picture of my, my mug. Um, I wanted to start off with something that I, um, I hadn't planned to, which was um, uh, talking about another project, um, one that's different from uh, what I uh, had submitted. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit, um, talk about what led to that job. Um, in 2015, uh, Baltimore City, in April of 2015, um, had a, a terrible tragedy occur when uh, Freddie Gray, was um, was uh, was found uh, dead um, and in custody of, of the police after um, after an infraction that uh, led to a, a great deal of confusion here. There was an uprising that occurred that lasted for two days in that April, um, and during that time, uh, a good deal of what occurred uh, happened. To a high school here that was um, has a great history in the city. The, it was a black high school that goes back quite a few years called Douglas, and adjacent to that high school is Mundalman Mall, which is an inner city mall patronized primarily by the black community, and had seen an uptick in uh, in its uh, in in its quality thanks to some major. Um, uh, franchisees coming in and, and helping out. Um, unfortunately, that unrest uh, ended up damaging quite a bit of that mall. And you were probably familiar with things that you saw on TV at the time, um, portions of a neighborhood that's called Penn North and all along the Pennsylvania Avenue corridor. When that occurred, it left an indelible mark. Um, Folks didn't know exactly where to, to proceed from there. They didn't know where to go and what type of interventions needed to be made to repair the city um, and its ills. Um, I'm scrolling through some images right now that I did as part of a, a project with writer, uh, author, and uh, television writer, Rafael Alvarez, who's a Baltimore-based um, uh, writer and newspaper man. Uh, we are collaborating on a, on a series of articles that talk about what happened in 2015. By chance, this is not the most graceful image, <laughs> but by chance, um, through a series of pro bono projects that I had done um, in the city with 501c3s, I was approached by General Growth Properties, uh, Baltimore Gas and Electric, and Whiting Turner. Two pretty, I mean, three pretty, pretty big uh, companies in the in the area, to look for something that could have a, an impact within the community. You know, time tested in, uh, organizations that knew how to do these interventions and work with folks from job placement to to health uh, impacts to food insecurity. We got a hold of four different entities. And the thought was to put them into the mall, into a working space that let them, in, let them intervene with people's lives who are affected by what occurred. So what we did is we, we found an empty storefront. that used to be a, a party store. You'd buy party favors and things like that. We found that storefront and we found ways to, uh, to put together a co-working space. This is pre-COVID. 
mind you. So <laughs> the density that you're seeing in this space is something that we're going to have to investigate as we uh, as we come out of this and people start returning to their to their offices. But the goal here was to put them all in the same place to create an outreach center where people could walk in and be triaged and be serviced. Um, and it was successful. We uh, sat down, we went through all the different uh, requirements and spatial requirements. And we came up with a co-working space that was flexible, that allowed meetings, that allowed uh, uh, private uh, consultations, that allow allowed giveaways of materials and books and food. Um, and it was completely uh, able to flex out into any different configuration for events and for working. When we completed it, we had a, a good deal of people from the community that attended. And just so happens that nearby, there were some folks who were um, running a cafe called Dubcoat Cafe. And they were interested in taking this concept further, but from a retail standpoint, from a commercial standpoint, just by chance, uh, chance meeting, they said, hey, we've got an RFP that's out on the street. Um, the city has our RFP out on the street. We wanna go after it. And what it called for was taking an existing market called the Avenue Market. That's along Pennsylvania Avenue in the same vicinity and converting it from something that was I scroll through these images. The, the market has been, it's been there for quite a while. You know, it's been there since the 1870s. There's been some type of a, 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 an entity there where uh, goods and services were exchanged. And in the 1950s, it, and it, it suffered, a, suffered a horrible fire in the 1950s. They rebuilt the mafia market. And they wanted to know if there was some way that we can intervene and make it uh, something that was, was current something that was different and something that was holistic. There's so many different entities who've touched on this idea. There's so many different overlays of, of, of studies that have been done by uh, city, the neighborhood, neighborhood design center, the Upton, Upton neighborhood community, uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, Black Arts District. Everybody's come up with ideas to, um, to bring this, this area and this market back. So the, the, the ideas are, are there for the taking. It's a matter of somebody picking up the ball and running with it. It's an enterprise zone, which provides a lot of opportunities for the monies and development. The building itself uh, is in really tough shape. A lot of it's deferred maintenance. A lot of it was you know, poor decisions that were made um, from uh, a systemic standpoint. And it needed a lot of work and it had some, uh, some aesthetic things that were pretty dated um, from a series of, of renovations that they had done over the last 30 years or so. So we went through and documented all those deficiencies and found out that uh, it was just becoming something that was worn that hadn't been uh, managed very well and its operations weren't very clear. I won't dwell too long on this because I understand that we're, we're limited on time. Market now is not too different from any other city market. Baltimore City has a, a series of public markets um, and they're all undergoing some type of a renovation. They're all being looked at. Um, all of them have been in really tough shape for years and now we're, we're just starting to get uh, footing to, uh, uh, to bring them all back. And this one currently uh, is, Primarily um, prepared food. There's very little in the way of fresh food. There's very little in the way of a system that that integrates all of these different vendors, whether it's you know bread and cheese and and produce and all these things that are um, that are united and selling things that are varied and healthy. Um, right now, um, what you, if you were to go there today, there's only one vendor. Uh, of note that's, that's operating, um, that is attempting to do healthy things and the rest is just, you know, prepared food that are out of, that could essentially be out of the same kitchen. Um, portions of it are, um, are empty as well. Supermarket that's on the left has, uh, has since, um, has since gone over, I think they left about two or three years ago. Um, and, the, the vendors that are at the front that face Pennsylvania Avenue, 
uh, those have been empty for some time as well. There were markets and restaurants. So we were approached by the owner who uh, they, uh, they had a really plucky sort of spirit about them. They, before we even arrived, uh, our team even arrived, they had thought through quite a bit of the programming of the space. Um, they're gonna be really embarrassed that I showed this, uh, this particular sketch that they had <laughs> of the desired layout, but it told the story. It actually you know, put into place the things that they thought could happen um, to make this, this uh, market successful again and to not make it a food court. There's a trend around town right now of taking what used to be uh, markets where people bought and sewed things that you can go home and prepare. Um, those things are being replaced with what is essentially a series of, of mall food courts. Um, it's the sort of measure of success that they found when it comes to these types of uh, these type of types of figure out if their desire uh, layout could actually happen within uh, uh, the footprint of the building, and it turns out that the, it was it was possible, and it gave us actually some additional space to um, to do a couple of other things programmatically. In addition to that, they um, had a lot of ideas about uh, visually what could be done along Pennsylvania Avenue. We're really lucky in that we're adjacent to, we're in a neighborhood called Upton. We're adjacent to a Metro stop, uh, which is an unbelievably fortuitous thing to, to, to come upon if you wanted to um, sort of increase these ills that have visited, uh, to, to decrease these ills that have visited the neighborhood. There's, you know, this is no different, Upton's no different from any other place in, in Baltimore City. And in the country, for that matter, it has these tent poles of, of deficiencies. It has has crime. Uh, uh, the market has become notorious in its reputation uh, for crime. Unfortunately, uh, it, it has issues of density. There's a lot of vacancy, and as a result, there's a lot of open space in between. Um, and as a result, it's it, it, it's a pretty intimidating place to be. Um, it's got businesses that have collapsed or that are sort of partially operating. Um, and as a result, um, it, it doesn't have the sort of proper activity node that a, com a commercial ship would have, but they have transportation, which is one of the, the tent poles, one of the things that you can use as a building block and, and uh, emphasize. Um, and so we thought, well, let's make that you know, one of the main points of this. Let's resuscitate the, a plaza that they have adjacent to the building. Let's uh, also take advantage of some of the hardscape that they have there. There's uh, existing parking that they that's shared by other um, other uh, other businesses, and it's owned by the city. I thought was well, how can we populate that? Can we create a, an open air farmers market in addition to having something um, that's enclosed? You know, can we have another room, basically another space that we could we could introduce? And you know, how do we address the street? Um, we looked at a bunch of different markets. The owners spend quite a bit of time in South Africa where there's a series of markets in places like Johannesburg. Uh, we've spent time uh, separately in place like, uh, places like Barcelona, which have these incredible markets that open up to the street. Um, you know, it's something that um, uh, it sort of breaks up uh, this tension between all the traffic that occurs along the main thoroughfare, and then, and then just a simple sort of shuttered front door with uh, this ambiguity of, of where the entrances should occur. The idea was to enliven that with shops and markets uh, along that Pennsylvania Avenue phase and a really large inviting, inviting opening as well. This is a site plan view of the same thing as we developed it further showing some interventions to make, uh, to take advantage of some of the sustainability options that we have. Uh, solar that's being introduced, we're reconfiguring parts of the hardscape to be soft. Um, and then the market itself, taking their idea and uh, actually putting it to work, we were able to set up an instance where the, uh, the portion of the building, just about a third of it is dedicated to um, 
a multi-purpose room and a commercial slash demonstration kitchen where uh, the kitchen itself would not be uh, something that was uh, just used by one entity the way that it is now. It would be shared by all the different vendors and also serve as a training space. There's a lot of incubators that have been popping up around town and around the country. Um, and you see the, the results of uh, the, the fruits of their labor with a lot of different businesses being opened in Baltimore um, in recent years. And as food trucks and, and markets where they've been able to prepare their food without having uh, their own brick, the cost of their own brick and mortar. Um, so the idea was to use this kitchen, not just for training for folks externally, but also to use it for all of the prepared folks, the prepared food that, that's being pre uh, done by folks in the market as well. Uh, the playhouse, the nickname for it, the multi-purpose room, uh, could uh, flex out to any number of uses from theater to training to banquet, the community meetings, the trick was to have it so that you could uh, flex this thing out as fast as possible and um, also have it quickly uh, accessible by, by way of the adjacent parking lots that are on the north and south side of the building. The, uh, the other portion of the market, it was the east portion of the market that fronts on Pennsylvania Avenue, is a series of, of prepared stalls along the top but uh, it's also got a series of uh, stores that really complete the whole circuit of what you would need if you were just shopping. There's a, a food desert in this area, the way that we have in a lot of different neighborhoods in Baltimore. So the idea was to mix it up. You had general stores, beer and wine, co-working space, bookstore. There's a, um, a diner in the middle, a series of uh, produce, and uh, uh, vendors in the center, flower stand, juice stand, uh, a proper bodega, a proper New York bodega, bakery, dairy, uh, meat and seafood, and then a, a diner that's at the front that's uh, at the front that's facing Pennsylvania Avenue. Bird's eye view uh, shows how uh, they want to integrate the, uh, the north parking lot, this is facing southwest, North parking lot to show um, that there's uh, there's vendors that are located there on weekends and certain certain days of the week um, whenever there's flexibility to do it um, so that it serves as a market similar to what we have with the JFX market the Waverly market and the same thing is true on the southern side on the bottom of the screen it shows the Metro Center that the up Upton Metro Center and its adjacent plaza and its ability to, to um, to receive folks directly into um, the market at the, uh, at the entrance along the bottom as well. The, uh, one of the things that's, uh, that's a little uh, tough right now uh, at, at, at the market is that you really don't get an idea of where it is until you're upon it. Although it has these super graphics, it's still something that gets lost. It's probably one of the least known places in the city uh, of, of, its, uh, of the public markets uh, that we have. So the idea was to put up a, a additional signage on each side on the north and the south side and really open up the front of the building with as much glazing as we possibly could. We'd repurpose the brick. There'd be some additional cladding that we put along the base as well as some murals that occurred, panels all along uh, panels along the side. Um, the thought is that we, we wouldn't sort of buy into any particular um, uh, sort of themed uh, sort of style. We wouldn't buy into any particular vernacular. We wanted to keep it as simple as possible, as elegant as possible. Um, I'm gonna flip through these because I, I just saw some folks pop up on the screen. I hope that I'm not eating up all the time. <laughs> Um, this is a closer view of the plaza that we're using to engage the public, the metro, and the building. And then just a few interior images. Um, again, there's, I think that there's this tendency to, um, to simply sort of circle the wagons, to pe put people around a, an open space, but seating in the middle, and then just put a series of vendors that are essentially the same. Um, 
You know, it's you, know, you have one cuisine next to another cuisine next to another cuisine, and they're really not complementing each other in any any specific way. You can't go to those places, shop for a family, and go home and prepare the food. You can only go there and you know buy their product. Um, we're trying to push away from that and make all of these different vendors uh, sort of integral. Um, the the architecture is, is subservient here. It actually the most important thing to me and just and every team was to make sure that the operations of this really brought something that was substantial into the neighborhood. I should point out this is all this is all in progress. Um, this isn't complete. We uh, just started schematic design. There's been a bit of a pause on it, but we wrote a feasibility study in 2017 that for reviews. And now we're anticipating working with the community to flesh a lot of this stuff out um, even more than we have uh, we had in the past. And the thought was to create um, the things that were themed that referenced the uh, historic Pennsylvania Avenue area. It was, uh, it was an incredibly vibrant, culturally important place. It was the Harlem of Baltimore with uh, you know, legends like Cat Calloway and uh, Billy Holiday, who lived here, came from here, um, who populated uh, this stretch, went to school in this stretch, uh, they entertain in this stretch of, of, um, of, of, uh, of the avenue. And the idea was to bring some of that back through the programming, uh, even through the naming of some of the vendors. And that's that's the the sort of the, the overview of it. Um, there's been so many different attempts to uh, to do some kind of an intervention along that strip to bring it back from its from the tip of it at its southern southern end where it meets uh, uh, MLK all the way up to where it, uh, it hits Mondawmin Mall. There's been a series of small things that have occurred. Um, where they've tried to, to repair it. And it, the only problem is they haven't really uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, softened these edges. They haven't uh, woven these edges together. Uh, they haven't connected the dots between one community to another to another just yet. This could be a catalyst. This is something that uh, we're hoping will bring the entirety of that stretch together and give something that's ground, that's ground up that's grassroots, that's not a developer coming from the outside, pulling everybody in their direction. I think uh, historically Baltimore has, um, the community has always sort of been pulled along by development. It's been pulled along by investment where people can, um, can make the most amount of money off of these types of places. It hasn't been pulled along by the community. Uh, I think this is the first real attempt to do that. This is uh, folks who live there, who've proven their worth, who know what they're doing. Um, these are folks who are attempting to take that and pull it, you know, before looking at, you know, these motives of profit and these motives of, of gentrification. Um, here's an opportunity to take all of those different plans that, uh, that are being prepared all these reports that are being prepared by different entities and uh, put it into practice. Uh, this is the first real attempt in this city uh, to do this. And we're, we're hoping that we're successful. Very good. Uh, uh, I think, uh, thank you so much for, for, for presenting your project to us, uh, Jerome. I think uh, uh, organization, uh, by Christina, we, we should have Zico uh, present immediately afterwards, and then we can have uh, questions to both of you. Zico, the floor is yours. <clears throat> can you see my screen? Yes, we yeah, can okay. see it. Hi, um, no, thank you very much. I had a whole introduction for myself prepared, but uh, Roberto already did that. So I'm gonna skip that part. But uh, before we dive in into uh, spatial codes, I uh, 
that that leads to this point where I'm uh, at now. The image that you see here is uh, the place that I was born in Cavert Islands, uh, Santon Town. This is also basically the first, the first uh, my first encounter with architecture and building because building your own home is still a necessity in at the islands um, at this point, and they are. As you can see, we are at, at the bottom of a, of a mountain. And um, yeah, they try to, uh, to build with a lot of respect for, for nature. After that, we move, we move to the Netherlands. We moved to the Netherlands and I attended, um, I attended TV Delft. And there we was mainly focusing on uh, big buildings, star architects, uh, big cities, design more like the big stuff and um, um there was a really contrast between between Cavert islands and the and the netherlands rather than um uh, during the study like roberto always uh, already told i attended the semester with um at the university of michigan and um what strikes me here the most was was the the effect that that architecture and urban planning can do to to lives of people and um, especially in Detroit, I saw it uh, with my own eyes. Um, it was it was really devastating, and that I I, I took that with me in in forming my my opinion about how architecture should, should operate. Um, after graduation, during my freelance period, I also uh, I started period. This video started before I could finish my sentence, but uh, I also um, had time to spend spend uh, time in my homeland as an architect, and I encountered like a different phenomenon, a phenomenon that architecture can be really small, but also has a really big um, social component. What we see, what we saw here, was a group of local craftsmanship working as in a rhythmic um, system as a machine basically to, to lay down the top floor of building. And it's a festivity in the in the Caver, in the Cavert Islands, like at the top floor. Um, so after after I, I encountered all these experiences, I was still asking myself on okay, if architecture is all of that, how how can I incorporate incorporate that into my own uh, into my own practice and how do I define architecture for myself? So in this quest, I uh, I started a spatial codes, like um, like Roberto already told, a multidisciplinary architecture studio that focusing a lot of people and their natural habitat. Um, and our vision is defined by the sense of place and space, and the, especially the freedom to move and explore. Um, we are both active in in the Cavert Islands and here in the Netherlands. This is one small project of uh, we doing in the Cavert Islands, though our latest one in a different, in a completely different uh, context is totally raw, not not urban. Um, we have here in Copter, we have to deal with different parameters, like uh, especially drought, uh, hard winds, uh, rain and stuff, scarcity, materialization, and also lack of craftsmanship. So the detailing has to be really simple so um with this all i uh, i make the jump to the the dutch context that is the neighborhood where my studio is located is both for the just just one thing and sorry it, to interrupt uh i think you are brushing uh your hand over the microphone and we are ah, okay uh, sometimes we don't, we don't hear you very well okay okay no worries yeah. um, yeah go on thank you <laughs> yeah okay uh like both border to today uh, a total different context than than the cape Verdean context um we are here conducting uh, since 2019 a research uh, on how to, um, as a response, basically on a competition that was that was briefing uh, about how to how to include of how to create social cohesion within this 
specific, specific square you see here. And we thought yeah, that's, that, that's impossible. And we start to rephrase the question basically because um, the briefing and the question didn't, didn't, apply, didn't apply for the context. Um, what, we, what we did was actually, um, we took the program from the square and said, uh, if in order to create social cohesion, you have to spread it, you have to spread it because the neighborhood has a lot of potential. And uh, we have to we have to see the potential and, and benefit from that. So what we did basically was we start mapping the entire neighborhood and see what um, what part uh, where where the bottlenecks were where the bottlenecks were and we also stated in in response to the question of the briefing that in order to create social cohesion we need to empower the current inhabitant throughout education cultural development, ownership, and social security. And the social cohesion must follow from that. If we enable them to, to participate in the transition the neighborhood is currently undergoing as technically and socially. So um, that was our response to the briefing. And I have now a few examples of how we, um, um, yeah, how we, how we went to work. This is the first one. Um, it was about reactivating the, the uninspiring borders because what we saw was that um, the, the entire site was like, was like an abundance of uninspiring borders. Uh, for instance, the Geising flat courtyards, um, there's some pockets, pockets of green space between a typical like modern, uh, modern building on the backside of a main road called the Schiedamseweg with a lot of shops and also small restaurants and, and bars. Uh, as you can see in the image, the, the spaces are really undefined uh, with strange dark corners and um, you get this really, really unsafe style while being there. This map where it's located, you can see along this main... Yeah, what we proposed was actually to, to break to break the stores through all the way to the back to create this visual connection between the main road and the courtyard and also using and using the spaces uh, at the back as as a terrace for the small restaurant on the main road and we also imagine that during the market day uh, because it is a market uh, twice a week um, that the space perfectly can function as an extension zone for the for, for the market on the Fisserai plan, like on this part of uh, this part of the site. And this generation, this generated a, a continuity on interaction and also it generates, um, and it can flourish, flourish the square um, between the building blocks, like you see here. Another, an, another observation we did, um, where the roads, the roads leading to and from the um, from to and from the elementary schools there are in the neighborhood, because there are a lot of elementary schools in the neighborhood. And as you can see in this picture, uh, at the eyesight of 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 this of the child of, of the child that's growing up in this neighborhood, there's a lot of concrete. There's a lot of concrete, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of brick and gates. This there is. Basically nothing on their eye height, on their eye level that, that will trigger their imagination. And somehow I can imagine that it can feel like you, you, you're walking or you're wandering into, uh, in a tunnel. Um, this is an image of all the elementary schools. So we map basically and photograph basically all the, all the routes. And um, yeah, it was it, uh, yeah, it was it was strange to see that at one twenty height, there was basically no interaction with what was mainly mainly brick. So what we did was we proposed an, uh, somehow an inter interactive solution where we used the surface of of on their height as a canvas to project in, informative fun content like. Can say like an interactive game, uh, math questions, uh, small know-how 
just just to make the route from and to school for them more lively and especially with the usage of the iphone we saw a lot of a lot of opportunity to incorporate this this new this new form of living we're going into this semi physical and also a lot of digital so um yeah that's that was for this part and to close off like the research part um we we did we had a, we had a lot more covered but um due to the time we are um i'm limiting to just this three three parts um um this this one was was the 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 other observation we did uh there were the corners the corners of the the corners of the neighborhood um okay the corners of the neighborhoods historically those corners were like um they function as a semi public 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 function they were mainly uh inhabited by uh by bakeries or the were the, the local grocery or the butcher and stuff and they had this open character that that people around the, um around the neighborhood know and how to identify with it but if you can see in all in these images all these corners in this neighborhood are all closed off uh they're closed by uh, or window coverages or really like building built like closed um this is a, a map also a map we we did and you see all the dots are all the interesting um owner buildings uh, in this neighborhood that are all closed off. It's a really pity. Um, in this case, we came up actually with, with, a, with a contemporary approach about how to treat like the corners because we see the huge potentials of the corners and also as the function as a semi public uh, public uh, public function because the corner can connects basically the two streets the two walls connects with each other so um and a solution and we had to came up with a solution that was suitable for the for the neighborhood at this time a neighborhood that lacks a lot of inspiration um and a lot of uh, and a lack of of diversity at um at the level of craftsmanship so what we did we actually transformed these these parts into some kind of atelier uh, where we can put the craftsmanship uh, on display and combine them with housing we have an uh, occupation occupation around the clock uh, for for young creatives from the neighborhood to live there and also practice their art uh, on the street level and giving like giving their their gift give that to the to the neighborhoods so interact with them also and especially for kids, it uh, it can be really inspiring. This is an example of an of, of an impression we did, and this is based. I see the photo is a little bit blur, but this is our own office. Um, in the neighborhood, we inhabit um, a corner office ourselves, and 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 try to try to, um, yeah try to share like the vision we have for the corners like try to share them with the neighborhood and as you can see uh, this is us during one of the nighttime workshop uh, session we organize and it is for the neighbors is the point of reference um, for the children is point of interest they interact a lot with each other on their eye height we put a lot of um, models we put games and stuff and you see people really uh, interact with us and they um and i see that it works just it, it, it is proven that it works so uh, this is a concept that we need to roll out and the mun municipality needs to to get engaged with this with this concept because it will work because we can create throughout the entire neighborhood we can create some kind of promenade of, of craftsmanship um that can give this this neighborhood a lot of a lot of um, life and this time kind of stuff um and next to our own research we do here in the neighborhood we also connect a lot of a lot of with a lot with 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 create other creative thinkers um from the neighborhood they are all also doing their own thing and based on based on the vision we have how this public space should function 
in the neighborhood like Bospol Tustek. One of them is um, one of our partners is uh, Young World. Young World is a um, organization that focuses on youth well-being. Uh, this project is called Tabula Rasa, and in the spirit of graffiti, we are using like the borders of of the built environments as canvas to as canvas to to discuss. In this case, we are discussing a climate issue, but we're using um, but we want to discuss like social topics uh, on this on in in this manner just to to give the people to give like the um, the outcome back to the to the people. This is the question we stated: What's the influence on uh, the climate has on you? And um, what we do, we're, what we do is actually challenging people uh, and especially youth, uh, challenging them to to react on this question and write down their their association with with the topic uh, with uh, with the topic on the window there and there and there uh, and and maybe there's a, their concern also about what the future holds for them. Um, and in this project, we are basically letting these all these thoughts from the neighborhood let them on the window until the summer, and to also to provoke some kind of conversation between 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 neighbors. Um, and next to this this part, we also record a podcast with the youth that are in that are engaged with this with this this topic. Um, and here we have a small video of one of the sessions after. Yes, there was there was the the after movie of our of one of the one of the podcast. Um, can go now to the next project. There's another another partner we work together. It's called I Capitain. And what was interesting about his story because he he started off with a small boating uh, uh, rent company and. this area. So he, he connected me and we were discussing about, okay, how can we transform this one into a huge uh, uh, leisure, leisure, leisure area? So we start, start doing the an analysis about, okay, where are like the, the, the hotspot, uh, what kind of connection has to, be, has to be made? What is the role of the, uh, of the municipality in this one and what about the visibility and stuff and so um, basically we start working on the project just based on his imagination we came up with like uh, a strategy a strategy for for three phases how we could grow this project and all and at the end uh realize this this huge water recreation uh spot that is needed in this in this neighborhood 
then uh, now basically this is this is the impression of the of the of the first phase where we use like a modular parts to create a division between uh, between uh, the, the the spot where you can get in your boat and the storage place here uh, at the back and uh, this is the image during daytime and this is the image during nighttime where you can see we free up like this front part of the of the deck uh, store the boats at at the back to have them safe and while while freeing up this part we um, people at night can come and and just recreate swim a little bit or hang out along uh, along the water side this I Capitan. And the special thing about this one is, like I said, he imagined it, and um, it, it is an example of how the municipality is supposed to work in this neighborhood because he imagined it, and we start working together, and um, the municipality um, engaged engaged with it and supported the plan and uh, supported also in the execution. So that is. Um, that's for me one of the examples how it's supposed to be in, in a neighborhood with a lot of creative thinkers um, who had idea for their own neighborhood and to want to flourish their own neighborhood. And the third project to close off is um, just to, to, to continue in this new design culture is a project we're doing with the night shop. The night shop is an urban, urban research center uh, here in the neighborhood. And they are researching how to use the, the social capital in the design process. And um, this is a, a project in, in process. It is like a big square because both pull the plane. It is a really, really also undefined, not proportional, a lot of cars. Um, uh, you see display areas, a little bit in between nothing. And so, so this 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 square is a little uh, it's a little pain in the ass for a lot of neighbors, but also for the municipality. And um, but what we see is that a lot of a lot of people, especially the youth, are are based their identity based on this on this square. They share a lot of memories and they share a lot of uh, a lot of experiencing growing up uh, with this square. So what we did basically was we, we we took them and put them in the lead of the design process and not only by by ask them to participate in some kind of participation session of in a workshop but really put them in the lead and uh, held them accountable for the content that they produce this this is one of the session we had here in uh, at the office because um yeah, in this method, we 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 tap in in their energy, and also we send them away to go and collect information from others, not only from themselves, but from others to grow their perception about the square, and also to to enrich us, and enrich and like shape the direction of the project. Um, uh, does does that and to end off. Um, I have this one quote about how an architect is an organizer of life process and as an organizer we must engage with other disciplines as well as the society we impacted by his work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very, very much for your uh, great presentation. It's nice to see all these beautiful images of, uh, of, of Rotterdam. Uh, we are going to have uh, opportunity for uh, questions from the audience, but I'd like to, to start off by asking my own question, if you don't mind, uh, for both of you, for Jerome and Zico. Uh, how would you uh, define your practice in terms of who are you? Are you an advocate uh, architect, an activist architect, a facilitator? And is there space and a role for co-design? So maybe we should start with the uh, with Jerome. Uh, what do you think? How do you define yourself as an architect? Um, it's a horrible although, question. I <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good question. Of the options that you said, I, I think I'm more of a facilitator. Um, mm -hmm. There's um. 
my God, I, I wish I could uh, put a number to the amount of, of folks that I've sat down with to, to review their, their thesis. And the intent is, is to change the world through architecture. Um, it's a noble, noble idea, it's a noble cause. Um, I certainly believe that architecture um, you know, it has a profound impact on, uh, on, the, on the, the lived environment. But I think that we're, we're servants. And I think that um, you know, we're there to, to be interpreters of what, what folks need. And I, I think that that's, that's the role that I, I try to play. Um, mm -hmm. I try to bring other people's vision um, to life. Great. What about you, Zico? How would yeah. you define yourself? I also I define myself morally um, as a um, as a facilitator because mm -hmm. I, I I see like like the great responsibility uh, architecture and urbanism brings in, in in directly or indirectly shaping people's lives. So um, it is it is a delicate profession. And I, I think that um, as an architect and architecture is, 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 is facilitating the people. So yeah, I see myself more as a facilitator. And what's the role of, uh, you mentioned Anziko that uh, you use code design. Can you tell yeah. us more about that? How, I, how we do that or? Yeah, how do you do it? And how, what's the importance of code design? The importance of co-design is is basically um, is to 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 get the project further. I see that because um, I have one set of I have one set of skills and maybe one one predefined vision on something. And working together with with uh, with other people um, in the process, basically, uh, really in the process, and also make them part of the process. Um, uh, we can we can get to can get the project to a different height, I see. And um, we can also, um, yeah, we can reach more. We can reach more and reach, get further in this, in this vision about how, how architectural urbanism or how space is supposed to function. Great, oh, well, I totally agree with you. Uh, Jerome, do you have thoughts about co-design? Have you had experiences of co-designing with citizens? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a there's there's a certain amount of of, of militancy that goes mm -hmm. into into that process. Um, when working with the communities that I've um, I've worked with, they um, they they're they're often dispossessed. I do a lot of pro bono stuff for five hundred one c threes. And these are people who don't normally have a voice. They're pushed around by either policy or by, um, or by developers like I was discussing earlier. And it's the perfect opportunity for me to let them you know, be participants. That, that sounds wrong. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a perfect opportunity to you know, have these participants who uh, throughout the process from day one, whether it's community reviews or sitting down and having charrettes with folks um, and being as open as possible um, mm -hmm. and letting them have a voice. It, it just doesn't happen very often. And I try as hard as I can to make sure that I'm working with folks to do that. Yeah, sometimes I think the idea uh, is difficult to put into practice, isn't it? It's it's, yeah. it's a good idea, but uh, sometimes it's difficult to organize it and to have time for yeah. co-design. We have Marcel Zimmerman. Would you like to uh, make your comment, Marcel? In, in, you, you say that it's the first time you see an architect uh, talking about themselves as a servant. Is there a question there? I'm putting Marcel in the in the fire here. Maybe he's not. Mm, I'm not sure they can. Uh, they they have the power of. Uh, oh, maybe they voice. can. They, uh, they oh. cannot uh, speak. Okay. 
Oh, okay. So we, we only have, guys, uh, Ben, I have to say you have to uh, write your questions in the chat. Uh, maybe the way that the Zoom uh, call was set, uh, we can't hear you. So please tell us about your, your questions. Uh, I have a, another, uh, another observation, Jerome. You talked a lot about serendipity, about chance. A lot of things happen by chance. Did you notice yeah. that? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> well, who, was it uh, Michael Jordan that said that uh, you know there's 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 no luck. It's just uh, hard preparation, and it brings luck about. I'm butchering the, the quote. Um, but yeah, the, the, you know, what happens is you um, you start to practice with just one job, and mm -hmm. um, it just starts to to ping other opportunities. Um, I, when I started um, my company, I had no particular business plan other than to try to help people out as much as I could. Um, and I didn't know where it was going to take me. And it ends up, uh, you know, by the, the project that I presented for uh, Touchpoint, for instance, I just happened to be doing a walkthrough, a punch list of a job for something called the Women's Housing Coalition, where they wanted a portion of their building that's in downtown, uh, just small pieces of it renovated, a gymnasium uh, or exercise space that we created and an office space and a health clinic. And on that walkthrough, it just happened to be walking through with one of the CEOs who um, was, uh, was associated with, uh, with Touchpoint. And uh, it also just so happens that, you know, I, I walked his daughter through without even knowing who she was. And then that led to them calling and saying, that was great. We think we have a relationship um, you know, here that we can, we can further. Can you help out? We just had a devastating occurrence here in, our, in this neighborhood. Can you help out? And I um, said, sure. And then on the day we had the punch list for that, I went to get, grab a bite to eat at Dovecoat Cafe. And the two owners pulled me aside and said, hey, we heard you were involved with Touchpoint. Uh, we have a big idea that we're not sure we can execute. Can you help us put the images together and some of the ideas together? So it's just pinging. Now, part of that is that Baltimore's small. I, I, I know Rotterdam's a big, big place compared to- It's not, <laughs> it's not. I think it's smaller. <laughs> it's smaller it, it, it's <laughs> large yeah. geographically. Isn't it pretty big geographically? Um, not particularly, it has no? less than, I think a little bit more than half a million people. Yeah, Six. exactly. Oh, okay. I totally. Seven. I think. I think. Um, no. It grew, I think that's it, it grew. It grew. It grew to almost a million right now. Yeah. Like oh, okay. Eight hundred thousand or something. Yeah. Eight hundred thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, well, you're, uh, we you're have close a. To... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Go on, Jerome. Um, but no, it's a it's a very small place, Baltimore. The both the the, the design community, and the development community, and um, you know, the, the authorities having jurisdiction, we all sort of cross paths. And so those serendipity is kind of, uh, <laughs> it's easier here than other Well, places. that's what I was going to say, right? Like uh, it is serendipity, but you are part of this community. So you are open and sensitive to, to these things when they happen, right? I think that's important. Uh, we have a question from Fer Dion. He's asking about well, all these things look fantastic, but how do you avoid uh, gentrification? So maybe we should start with the uh, with the Zico. Zico, how how is how is gentrification in Rotterdam? We know that the housing market is skyrocketing. Yeah, gentrification is like a big it's a big thing here in Rotterdam, and how you prevent it? Um, I think that is really difficult to present like the gentrification part. It is uh, it's, it's a money stream that is that come with, I can't speak for now this neighborhood. It's a money stream that come uh, with developers and stuff. And they are creating houses of, of a price, price tag that is impossible for people from out the neighborhood to, build, to buy it. So there, the gentrification stream is coming. So what we are trying to do basically is 
to try to 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 upgrade the public space and also upgrade the, the public uh, uh, interference uh, on the in the surface you know with these projects also just to 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 make sure that the, the current inhabitants can 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 gravitate and also uh, still identify with this with this spot so that they don't have to move because because they are the gentrification is coming so uh, to stop that is is like an impossible impossible task but what we can do is upgrade like what i said like the public space and make sure that that the people that are living here now can um, can grow can also grow with this with this transition and 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 feel and still feel at home in this in this some kind of, some kind of strange new place or something very good uh, look, uh, just to correct information for our viewers, uh, uh, Rotterdam has a little bit more than 1 million inhabitants in its metropolitan area and 600,000 in the city proper. So 600,000, it's not, it's not enormous, right? It, it looks big on the pictures though, because of the, all the buildings. Uh, uh, Jerome, what do you think? How is gentrification affecting uh, Baltimore? Well, um, it's you know not unlike what's happening in other cities you know, around the world. Um, there's opportunities to create sort of a bulwark um, that has to come from the community. Um, we have Johns Hopkins uh, University here, Johns Hopkins Hospital, and there's been a steady march from their hospital campus in particular, um, sort of outward, that these sort of rings have sort of grown over the years that I've been here. Um, and they've captured portions of neighborhoods that, um, that used to be, you know, predominantly low income, predominantly black. Um, and there hasn't been an opportunity to sort of push back and see those benefits. But there's some things that have uh, sort of softened those edges. They, they have worked with the community um, uh, on some things. There's some open space things that they've created. There's some housing that they've created that's, uh, that's helped out and they've added some density and added foot traffic and things like that. But the community organized, the community actually, you know, there's so many uh, feasibility studies and master plans and, you know, these good intentions by community groups that are sitting on shelves night, right now without any execution or any ability or any intention of executing them. Someone needs to take that. Someone uh -huh. needs to pick that ball up. Um, I'm hoping that we're those people. I hope Zico sounds like that person, um, you know, from a design standpoint. Um, and you hope other folks in their own, you know, positions do the same thing. Thank you. That's yeah. probably Pollyanna sounding, but I, I believe it. Well, before we, we uh, go on to the next question, I have another question uh, that I am uh, burning to ask you guys. Because I, uh, well, I teach at the uh, Faculty of Architecture and the Built Environment at TU Delft in the Netherlands. And the truth is, I have never seen a university where, uh, uh, how can I put it? We don't have a lot of black architects in the Netherlands. That's the truth, right? And uh, I think uh, I really would love to listen from you guys. What do you feel uh, is your role? Do you have a, a special role because you're black architects? Can you, can you do something different? And can you attract more people? Uh, to our architecture. I, I, I hope my question was uh, understandable. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah we, I, um, yeah, okay. So, please, Nico. Go. No, because I was, I was, I wanted to react to this, this, this part with where uh, Roberto was telling there are not a lot of black architects at the University of, okay, I was one of the, 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 the few we were like a small group small group of five and um now and now basically in the field we are like with also a group of five with one two three seniors uh 
uh, they are our household names and it feels it feels really to be honest it feels really lonely especially in the Netherlands because um, if you got you got invited into some kind of architecture committee or something you're like basically the only one or just or there is another guy so um if I see it as a special role for myself, I don't see it as a special role for myself. I somehow mm-hmm. I feel some kind of um, um, responsibility just to 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 promote the promote the architecture and also promote what architecture can be. That's what I stated uh, earlier. That uh, I want to 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 get get out a vision a vision what architecture can do. And then it's not only about just building buildings or houses or something. There is, there is more layers to architecture and try to make people understand, especially the youth, that it's, it is, it is a, it's a very, very, um, very, um, how do you say that? Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know the word in, in English, Dinsbar. Uh, Jeans bar. Uh, it's also, yeah, observant, yeah. and it's also a really challenging. But we need like more architects. And um, beside of that, the, the the design culture in the Netherlands needs to change also to to have to create the room also for black architecture to thrive and also young black architect architects to thrive also because yeah otherwise um, you see I saw a lot of them we saw a lot of them come up and then it somewhere in between they got lost or they get into another job or just they go uh, work somewhere else because it is it is challenging and I can speak for myself but um, yeah that basically uh, uh, let me tell you why I'm asking this I think uh, in the Netherlands at least and I think it's true in most western countries architecture doesn't follow the diversity in in the in in the country so uh, our Schools are not diverse enough, I would say. But uh, I don't know what's the situation in the United States, Jerome. Uh, the same. <laughs> um, it's lonely. Vico, you know, nailed it. It's it's lonely out here. <laughs> there's not a lot of us. There's um, in the Baltimore area. There's probably a half dozen uh, companies, uh, mm-hmm. flat companies. Um, we all know each other. <laughs> we, all, we all do the same thing. Uh, we all um, feel a little bit put out um, in some ways by the architecture community. We've formed a great bond. We have National Organization of Minority Architects here. And we're always talking. We're always speaking. We're always helping each other. Um, mm-hmm. we're, we're blessed here because we've got Morgan State um, and we've got Christina uh, she's she's doing a killer job over there. So we've got a great school um, right here and there's some, some potential. We also have a high school here. We have a high school of design that uh, has a lot of black faces there. And it's just, it's a joy to see when you go down there. And we've got Howard University nearby, just down the, mm-hmm. down the highway. I'm encouraged. Um, uh, it's, it's one of the things that I've, taken a whole lot more seriously over the last oh, dozen years or so of just making sure that I reach back, making sure that I try to give somebody else opportunity. I mean, there's I've passed jobs along with people, um, you know, to, to help them out. The, the big thing that I've been doing lately is whenever I go in for a, a project, whether it's an interview or, or whatever, I always try to encourage the owners no matter who they are, especially in the private sector. Like before you even think of hiring an architect, a contractor, anybody, just ask the simple question, can I hire a black architect? Can I hire Mm -hmm. a black contractor? It's not hard. (laughs) If you ask yourself the question, it's like, well, yeah, let's get one in here. Let's, Let's give them the same opportunity. We have a problem right now in National Football League here. from the hiring of coaches, um, and it's the same type of dialogue. Get me in the room. Yes. Get us in the room. Yeah, we'll, com- we'll compete. We can get it done. Um, yeah. but uh, I'm encouraged. I'm really encouraged. Though. 
thanks so uh, aim into that and thanks a lot guys i think uh uh, Ryan is tell, uh, telling me that we are approaching the end of our uh, uh, of our event today. Thank you so very much. This last question was amazing. I am so sorry we have to skip a few a few questions, but I'm I'm quite sure our guests are pretty approachable. So if you communicate with us, we will try our almost uh, best to uh, to get their question the questions resolved uh, and uh, reach uh, to reach our 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 panelists. So, well, yes, we uh, we went overboard, but I'm really, really happy. Thank you for being with us. This is the first of a series. So Jerome, Zico, Roberto, on behalf of the whole audience, Baltimore Rotterdam Sister City Committee, our partners, the IA Baltimore and the uh, Rotterdam City Academy from Balkums, I would like to thank you. Thank you for giving us so much knowledge and informing us on this important topic topics in a very um, elegant and respectful way uh, of this. I am really, truly thankful. Again, thank you very much. Good afternoon and good evening. Have a nice lunch or have a nice dinner. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Go blue, Zico. Go blue. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye-bye.